Moving to New Zealand is hard enough, but what about if you've got a pet to bring with you? What are the quarantine facilities like? Where will your pet be? How will it be not being with your pet? All of these questions are a massive part of you moving to the other side of the world. Very happy to see the government vet coming in doing the, the final uh, checkup on the pet before the family came and was able to be there for the happy reunion. Uh, the kids crying and the dog mm. running out and just the joy. In this week's episode, you're going to meet Brett. Brett is from Petwood Star Travel. He's a lovely, lovely guy and he shares with you everything there is to know <laughs> about bringing your pet to New Zealand. <laughs> it's a drama coming to you from Taranaki, New Zealand. Hello. Daddy, I love you. My mother thanks you. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. So yeah, we can just carry on this conversation. So Brett, thank you so much for joining us this morning and talking about the, the massive topic of, of shipping your pet over to New Zealand. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, excited to be here with you guys. Can you just tell us a little bit about your company and what it is you do, what services you offer? Yeah, uh, so Starwood Pet Travel has been around for over 30 years. Uh, it's based out of the U.S., but we have other brands that specifically focus on pet travel around the world in Europe and in uh, South and Central America. And we focus purely on people's pets, uh, making sure we reunite families as they are relocating for personal for work, uh, for military, uh, whatever it might be, that uh, pets are, uh, we always say pets have moved from the backyard to the living room, to the bedroom, and now to the bed <laughs> for a lot of people. And so when they move, uh, getting their pets with them is a huge part of the move. And we hear it time and time again that I don't care if my furniture uh, sinks in the ocean as it's going across or the car doesn't make it. Don't do anything to my dog. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's a part of our family. And so that's what we get the joy of doing is uh, bringing families back together uh, all over the world with New Zealand being always one of our top destinations. Oh, there's, there are so many questions I want to jump in here and ask you about. Um, lots of people on our community have used Starwood Pet Travel. So we, 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 we love you guys already, but it's just we just want to jump in. There's, there's always little questions in my mind. When we emigrated from the UK, we didn't have pets. And no. um, I always think, wow, you know, it's all, it was almost like a relief that we came here and bought our pets when we were here. But yeah, it's it. They're more important than your kids, Brett. You know, they're just... <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I, I, I look at people and they spend money on bringing pets over to New Zealand. And it's cheaper than kids. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> a, a, life, a lifetime of kids is just a fortune. It's just like you, it's just like you need another mortgage, don't you? So Yeah, what... as a dad of three girls, I definitely understand. <laughs> yeah. Right now. <laughs> For sure. yeah, I looked it up the other day, actually, and something like, if you have a child, it costs you something like $300,000 or something like that. It's a like, day. It's yeah. so, so you ship worldwide then? So you, 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 do, you can deal with people in the UK and South Africa. Is that right? You, you ship worldwide? Yes. Uh, so we have different brands that are in the different uh, areas. And so we have staff in those local. Uh, when we always tell people when they're transporting their pet, where the pet starts is the most important piece because most of the work is going to be done there. The vet work, the planning, the flights. And so each country, if you're leaving from Japan, there's different rules compared to the UK, compared to the US. And so we have teams uh, that work in each country to make sure that the vet appointments, because we like to help the customer out uh, full service. So a lot of times people are hiring us to bring their pet to the vet for them to make sure all the paperwork is correct. Because the worst thing you could do is after all months of planning to come down to technicality. And there are some countries, it literally comes down to the color of ink used on the piece of paper or Mexico is famous for refusing things if it is month, day, year instead of day, month, year. Mm -hmm. And something as small as that, that a vet doesn't spend a lot of time doing paperwork for people's pets going overseas. And so we're our team. That's what we focus on. So we're able to help people make, ensure that all those things are proper. So it's the shortest travel possible for a pet. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what? I always say this. There are some things when you're emigrating that you spend money on. 
getting an immigration advisor. I know we didn't, but it was like 13 years ago, so it was a lot right. easier. But now when you look at the paperwork, when you hear the stories of people who are trying to do it themselves, and like you say, you know, there's just some things. Look, if you can afford it and it can make your life this easier, just let the professionals do it. Yeah, yeah I, Just I, let them I, help yeah. you out. I remember just, just down to like you're saying with certain things, it was like, you need a certified copy of your birth certificate. And I'm like, well, this is the original birth certificate. Why do I need a certified mm -hmm. copy of it? And it, it's the, you don't realize that you get that from the registrar, like, you know, and I remember when our kids were born and, and getting them registered, he said, do you want a certified copy? And I'm like, why do I need that? And he said, oh, you never know. And I said, how much is it? He said, 15 pounds. And it was cheap, like, you know, and it's like, yeah, I'll have one of those. So that, that saved me so much heartache, mm -hmm. you know, just, just those little details, isn't it? Just one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. We had this um, uh, famous chef in the, in the States and we moved her uh, pet and she did a podcast after the move and, she said a funny line that's always stayed with me. She told her audience, she's like, you don't want to know what I paid, but it was the best part of the move. Yeah. She's like, it was by far the best part of the move. And, yeah. and we always tell people it is, it is going to be, when people relocate, it's already incredibly stressful. Yeah. And a lot of times people are relocating for work. And so a change of a job, change of house, all this stuff are already at the top of the stress pyramid. And then you put the pet in and all the unknowns and the uncertainties of what airlines to use and what paperwork and how to ensure this. And, and so we always encourage people, like, if you want to try to do it yourself and the country allows, a lot of countries are changing that and not even allowing people to do it themselves because there has been so many issues of incorrect crates to paperwork and issues at the airport. And, and as you can imagine, people get so frustrated. You get there the day of the airport, the day of your travel, you bring your pet and the documents aren't right oh. and the airline rejects you, but you have your flight. And so now what are you going to do yeah, at exactly. that point? And so people don't realize that, you know, it's a, it's already very stressful. And so working with a company like ours, where that's what we do, we don't focus on the other sides. We're not going to help you move your household goods or help you with your immigration paperwork for you, but we can ensure that your pet's going to arrive there and we have relationships with airlines and we can know the process. So it saves you a lot of headaches. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So let's pretend that I'm living in the U US and I want to ship my my dog. What, how do the, what does the process look like from start to finish? I'm moving to New Zealand and I want to bring her with me. How does that look? Yeah, so we always tell people if you are starting the process, it's good to bring in a professional in the beginning. The price doesn't change but the headaches do. Um, if you start from the beginning, it at least ensures the vet work and paperwork go in the proper order and we don't have to go backwards. I was just seeing a customer today, their rabies stuff was all wrong. And so now they got to like restart. And if we would have started in the beginning, like we would have been able to catch things right away because and for New Zealand specifically, you know, your microchip on your pet is the pet's identity. Uh, people don't realize, people think it's more if my pet gets lost, that's my microchip. The microchip actually doesn't help you at all when your pet's lost. Yeah. Uh, your microchip is just a 9, 13 digit number. And that's it. That's all it is. But it's the identity of the pet. So it does tie the pet to the paperwork. And so New Zealand with their biosecurity uh, rules, like that's the only way to ensure that this pet is with this paperwork. And so once you start your rabies uh, vaccination is set, then there for New Zealand, there's a blood test uh, that's required. And, and what that does is that basically checks the, the levels in the pet to ensure that the pet doesn't have rabies. And so there's a, there's a first draw. And then right now it's a three month waiting period for New Zealand where then they check the numbers again. So there's another blood draw. So the pet's not traveling during that waiting period. So they're going to be waiting here in the U S and so that's why we tell people like, like we got to plan these out because it's not going to be one week and we're going to be able to turn this around. Um, and so once we get all that clear, once we get all that approved, then it's now getting the, the flights and the quarantine reservations and the New Zealand paperwork handled to ensure that the pet can actually hop on a plane, fly, arrive. Um, mostly it's arriving North Island. 
uh, from the state. So it is coming into Auckland where um, one of the quarantine facilities, uh, New Zealand, different than Australia, is not a government run. They are privately run. So there's multiple options where Australia, there's only one uh, quarantine facility in Melbourne, where Auckland, we have multiple uh, facilities uh, that we're able to use. And then uh, they'll be in quarantine for 10 days. Um, great facility. I was just at one of ours in uh, October of last year and just very happy to see uh, the vet coming in, uh, the government vet coming in, doing the the final uh, checkup on the pet before the family came and was able to be there for the happy reunion. Uh, mm. The kids crying and the dog mm. running out and just the joy. Um, if it is going down south, uh, then after quarantine, uh, then we can book a domestic New Zealand flight um, and get the pet uh, down south um, uh, for their kind of final leg at that point. So, so just, oh, let me just say, so going back to that three month period that you talked about with, is that a quarantine in the USA or is it just the dogs? No, that's to... just at your house where, oh, right. you know, uh, so you can do that before you're relocating. Right. It's just basically a waiting period between when the first blood draw happens and then the second blood draw happens. Right. And so it's basically just looking at these levels uh, that yeah. they're looking at and making sure that they're not any higher level that the pet would show if they had rabies uh, on that. So that three month period, there's no rules on where they can be, can't be, as long as they're staying in the United States. Um, And then each country coming into New Zealand will differ. So some countries will have different rules on that. And and that's where I think a lot of people do get confused too, is if they are traveling, um, we've seen it with cruisers or yachties that are going to different places they're saying well what is this way well it depends on where you came from and how you're coming in to where those rules kind of sit so is there any country that is i don't know if you know the answer to this but is is there a country that's easier than others like is there a country where it's like oh you're all right if you're from there you're easy it's going to be fine to get your dog in but or you know and is there a country that's like super difficult where it's like Oh, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have to go through these massive steps to get your animal over. Does it differ? I'm just interested. Yeah, uh, yeah. Australia and New Zealand always work well together. Um, similar biosecurity r- uh, rules and laws, and so it's always much easier to transfer between um, the two than it is to come from the UK or the US on that. There's also countries that. Um, you know, New Zealand would say, like, we don't know the quality of paperwork coming out of those. And so some countries in Africa or South America, where, you know, it might be impossible um, to even import a pet from those locations. And so, and and those kind of, those change over times too, where countries, the United States just did this last year, where they actually embargoed a hundred countries in one day from pets arriving from and and so they've kind of gone back and loosened it up a little bit but like even places like uh uae was listed and so we were like having to tell customers like if you're going there we can't ensure that your pet could come back wow. and they've since last that and now pets can if they at least got their rabies here but it's just everybody is trying to manage the quality of care and vaccines in these countries and to ensure that if a pet does get vaccinated from rabies, that that vaccine is actually a proper vaccine and the paperwork is actually proper. And so each country kind of makes their own rules on who they trust more than other countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I always thought that this is really ignorant, but I just, I always thought rabies was like an old fashioned thing that isn't around anymore. You know, when you talk yeah. about rabies, it's, I think, oh, surely dogs don't have rabies. Do they? Is it like a really, is it a common thing? It isn't. Um, so U.S. has been uh, canine rabies free for many years, um, but there still is technical rabies in the United States with, you know, raccoon or, mm. so there is other wildlife that could carry rabies. And so because of that, we're listed as a rabies country. And so with any country that has the potential of having rabies, then that's where the extended rules come into play uh, on that. And that's why they kind of put those because 
New Zealand is protecting their country from that arriving. And that was the same reason the United States embargoed 100 countries is they said, we've eradicated canine rabies. We can't have it come back. And so we don't know. And it was a lot in COVID with um, people adopting like street dogs in the Caribbean and some of this that they just, there wasn't the paperwork to Mm -hmm. show, you know, uh, where the pet was and their vaccine. So, Mm. yeah, I think, I think what it was, you grew up in the UK and that was apparently rabies free. Yeah, so, it was just, yeah. it was so something you, you, yeah, like, you you it, yeah. about it. It's like, well, surely that doesn't, eat, but like, yeah, it makes sense to me now because it's like you say, raccoons and animal, wild animals and things like that. You don't think about that. You just tend to associate it with dogs and that's it, yeah. don't you? Yeah. But yeah. So thank you for clearing and that up for me, Brett. So. <laughs> yeah. And it's different because the UK could say they're rabies free, but another country could say the UK isn't rabies free. Yeah. Mm. And yes. so the UK goes into rabies categories for certain countries. Right. And so it's just interesting. It's all into the, the country of import and mm. what they decide. And, and so where New Zealand, the US, uh, UK is probably the top two importers uh, coming in. And so have pretty similar kind of rules and standards for how pets arrive. So, Brett, and I know we're going to put a caveat in at the beginning of the show, and I know this this question will change. It, it's not a set answer, but and we talked about it earlier, didn't we, where we said the different countries are changing different rules all the time. So you have to do your homework. And we're recording this in March 2023. So this is, you know, as of now, but it can change at any time. But what is the, if I had a Labrador, I'm living in the US and I wanted to move him to New Zealand, what sort of costs am I looking at for that? Yeah, so one thing we always tell people when it comes to pets is pets cost is based off of size. And so a couple kind of misunderstanding of pet travel is pets do uh, travel in cargo. So your airplane is a nice round uh, cylinder Uh, usually cut directly in half. Passengers are up top, cargo's below. Cargo's very different than cargo was 15, 20 years ago. So if you flew 15, 20 years ago and you checked the bag and it came out on the conveyor, a lot of times that bag was cold. And you remember grabbing it as cold. Now you don't ever have cold bags. Well, they used to not pressurize and climatize cargo down there. Um, And so it was colder. Now, most aircrafts are completely pressurized and and climatized. So where a pet is at is the same temperature, same uh, pressurization as where we sit. Uh, So there's no difference uh, on that side. And But the way cargo works, where for passengers, you buy a seat. And if you're in first class, of course, you're going to pay more because your seat's bigger. And going back to economy, your seat gets smaller and you pay less. Well, they don't price it based off of how big of a person I am, but it's more how big of seat uh, I want. Where pets, they get priced based off how big their crate is. And so basically what an airline has done is they have quantified how much space is in cargo and they charge you for what you take up. So what your pet takes up. So if you have a cat, it's great. Uh, Small crate, small space, less money. You have a Great Dane or a lab, uh, you're gonna pay more. So it doesn't really matter what the pet weighs um, or the crate weighs. It's more the, we call it the dimensional volume, the size of the crate. And there are specific rules off of the crate. And so some people try to, make a smaller crate to save money. And that's not the best for your pet. Mm -hmm. And so there are rules inches above their ears. They gotta be able to turn around, lay down with their legs out, because it is, especially if you're coming from the US, like that's not a short flight. Mm -hmm. And you want your pet to be comfortable uh, on that. And so what we always tell people when it comes to cost, it's really dependent on multiple factors. You know, if you're covering the vet work or if we're covering the vet work, there are fees there. Uh, in the U.S., most of our New Zealand goes out of California. And so we like the Air New Zealand flights direct, get right into Auckland on that. But if you're started in New York, 
now we have another flight, a part of the equation. Now we have to get you. And so when I, if I want to go from New York to Auckland, I can buy one ticket. And even if I stop in LA and go on, it's still one ticket. A pet, you can't do that. Um, it's actually two tickets now because they have to stop in LA because there's vet work that actually has to happen right before they fly. And in the States here, we have the USDA and they have to sign off on the pet leaving right before the pet leaves. And New Zealand actually requires a crate seal where they put an official seal on the crate that they know that no dog ha or cat has been changed in that crate since the USDA sealed it. Yeah. So there's all these steps. And so it's always one of those hard things when people say like, what is it? And so we always tell people, you know, you're probably looking in the five to $10,000 range, mm -hmm. depending on the size of your pet, depending on if there are multiple flights, if there are vet work included, you know, we have the quarantine cost um, in uh, Auckland, if you are down in Christchurch, and now we have another flight. And so it really is dependent because once again, if you are going from New York to Christchurch, we actually got three completely different plane tickets. Yeah. And there's just, they don't give you a benefit of, oh, well, you already paid for one, so yeah. I'll give you another yeah. one for cheaper. Um, and so there are a lot of kind of complications. And then as you mentioned, government rules change. And so sometimes there's a new paperwork requirement. And so now that's another government fee. And so what we try to do with people is be very specific on our proposals, showing everything that's included. And because some people are like, well, you know, I got this price. And we're like, well, yes, but somebody did give you that price, but they didn't show you that you're going to pay this much for quarantine. Yeah. And you can't get to New Zealand without quarantine. So you're going to have to pay for that if they put it in or not. So we tell all of our clients, here's everything we're providing. Here's anything that you can do on your own, but here are what the costs are going to be. So you at least know a, a complete picture of what it's going to cost to move your pet. Yeah. I actually think that's, I think that's a good price. I was expecting more than, say if we went top, top end, 10 grand, I actually was expecting more than yeah, that. I didn't know how much it cost, but yeah. yeah. Still goes back to being cheaper than kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, kids. <laughs> and multiple pets, multiple pets do take that, you know, we've had New Zealand ones that have gone 40 plus thousand dollars. Uh, it all depends on how many pets size, you know, if we're doing boarding in the U S uh, on that side. So there are so many different pieces that can change a price. And so that's why we, our team talks to you as a customer first, figures out what your needs are, and then gives a quote specifically for your needs, because I don't want to show you boarding cost if you don't need boarding cost. Yeah. But if you're already in New Zealand and your pet's in the U.S. and you haven't started that process, and now we're going to be boarding for three months in the U.S., that's a real cost there. Okay, then, Brett, what about this? What about if I've got three young puppies who just want to stay together and I want to put them all in the same crate, please? So I'm just going to pay for one size crate and my three puppies can go in there. Is that possible? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I I don't think so. I'm going to caveat this. There are <laughs> certain like routes where if it is under a set age and you can prove it's the same litter, they do allow, I think, two. I don't think that's New Zealand um, on that. Um, I know domestically in the U.S. Uh, you can do two. Uh, from the same litter if it's under, I think, six months of age. Wow. Uh, what we see is there's not many puppies going from U.S. to New Zealand just based off of the time. Because yeah. by the time you're done with all the stuff, they're not a puppy anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so the cute little golden retriever you saw in your picture now is, you know, 60, 70 pounds uh, yeah. before they're arriving in yeah. Auckland. So. What is the most unusual pet you've ever like been asked to ship? <laughs> yeah, we've had some fun ones. Um, we did a grizzly bear for a movie. Um, oh and God. so from Los Angeles to Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and so we had to arrange <sighs> that. Um, we've done lions. Um, we've done the Aflac <sighs> ducks. 
in the States, the insurance company, Aflac. We've done their ducks. Um, so yeah, we've done wow. some Hollywood <laughs> um, for movies and, and so, but mostly uh, cats and dogs. It's just um, cats and dogs. Does anyone ship yeah, rabbit, we, rab rabbits? Can you ship a rabbit? And you can. Um, I My daughter has three rabbits, and so I, I love uh, little bunnies. And um, But uh, different countries have different rules, again, uh, when it gets outside of dogs and cats. And so mm -hmm. I did. We just actually helped um, a lady was kind of – I was tagged on Facebook uh, to a girl in need. Uh, she had uh, couldn't find a job in the state and lost her visa and was having to return home to Vietnam and was just so sad because the bunnies were what kept her together during COVID. Oh. And now she was going to have to leave her six bunnies behind. And then not, my heartstring just like pulls because I can't imagine my own daughter not being able to bring her bunnies. And, and so um, we have successfully got them to Vietnam through oh, Cambodia man. and ground into Vietnam. And it was very circuitous routing, but uh they're back together and we're very happy that we were able to kind of help, uh, yeah. help her oh. keep her family together. So that's a nice story. That's lovely. Well, <laughs> another one, what, what about reptiles? Can you do reptiles? Like snakes? Yeah, and each, stuff? yeah, it's what we see is like, we call them companion animals. And so not saying snakes can't be a companion animal, yeah. but when you get into what it costs to move a pet, you usually see the dogs and cats, people are more apt to spin that. Yeah. Uh, when you get into the goldfish and, and hamsters, uh, people aren't as, you know, likely to spend. And each country, you know, the rules are so different. Um, yeah. Some countries, it's a hard embargo, no. Um, these type of animals cannot come in. Other countries say they can. And so that's why you really want to talk to somebody that would yeah. know to be able to say, okay, if it is bunnies, because uh, even the crating is different requirements. Mm. And so you can't just put a, a bunny, you know, and, you know, a certain crate that might be okay for a dog in the certain countries. It might have yeah. to be different. And so, but it really comes down to those individual countries on what they feel is available to come in and what they want. Some even on breeds, uh, some countries, it comes down to breeds of dogs. Certain mm. breeds are banned. Um, and so stronger breeds sometimes are banned in certain countries. Um, so some countries, if the ears have been snipped or the yeah. tail has been doctored, uh, those pets are not allowed in. And so it really kind of runs, uh, that's why it's, our industry is very interesting because it is trying to figure out, okay, what are my rules here, but what are the rules there yeah. and, and for each pet. Yeah, yeah yeah and going back to that heartfelt you know the, the the girl in vietnam i just think this is a big question that comes up on the group as well is like these people are handing over their you know the the, the love of their life their pets just do, do, do these animals get any like um cuddles or are they are they do they have much human contact or is it just like no one is allowed near them because they're in like this crate and how, how does that work what 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 what, what does that look like yeah, uh, we try to make sure that pet travel is as stressless as possible. Now, travel is stressful in general. Um, for humans, it's stressful. I was just flying last week and just walking through the airport and seeing some people running with their bags. You got some people, you know, just stressed out at the ticket counter and it's stressful. And so we always say like, we, we want to ensure that it travels as stressless as possible. And, but each pet is so different. And so there are ways to kind of help mitigate that stress. And so like one of the ways is if your pet isn't comfortable with their crate, we always recommend getting that crate ahead of time and getting your pet comfortable mm. with the crate. That's one of the idea. issues we see mm. is when a pet's not comfortable in that crate, they already can feel your stress and anxiety and so when you put them in that crate for the first time, and that's the time we're picking up to bring to the airport, like that's a very stressful time for the pet. So we recommend, we have like a three week process where bring the crate in your house, keep the door open the whole time, but like throw a ball in there for the first week. 
Second week, put food in there. Don't shut the door. Let the dog come in and out, eat. Third week, put their food in there and shut the door while they eat. And then you let them out just as a way of kind of getting them used to it. And, and we intentionally route, so if we go back to that like New York to Auckland route, we intentionally route to give the pet breaks in travel. So while they do have to get to LA, they're going to be there a couple of days, but they're going to be at a great kennel and they're going to be with people and they're going to be loved on and cared for. Um, when we get to the airport, they are like for New Zealand, they're sealed. Their crate is sealed. It's a government rule. Um, it's not our rule. And so because of that, like there can't be the pet coming out. Now I've been in many cargo facilities. People love pets being there. And so this isn't this like, oh, uh, there's a dog here. It's usually the cargo people aren't doing their job because they just <laughs> love this cute dog or this yeah. great cat. And so I have seen many times cargo employees talking to the pets. Um, and, and I, because I think it's so important to use airlines that we can trust, I intentionally go around the world to visit airports to make sure that pets are actually being transported properly to ensure when we tell a customer going to New Zealand, that's why I was there in October, is to watch the whole process of how pets are coming off the airplane. And so once they do arrive in New Zealand and they get to quarantine, quarantine facilities are just amazing. Okay. Um, they are not, um, there. a lot of times there's TVs in the kennel runs for the dogs to watch TVs. The catteries <laughs> are great, multi-levels. They can jump all around. They can put, um, siblings together a lot of times in quarantine and so kind of as they are traveling in separate crates that when they get to quarantine they're kind of back together again um and and so you don't work in this industry if you don't love pets yeah. and so you don't work at quarantine if you don't love pets and so we all know that the pets are stressed but we also know that the pet parent is usually much more stressed than the pet and okay. so it's mostly common the pet parents fear that you know they're not the only pet to ever fly millions of pets fly every year and so you know it'll could be a stressful 10 days as you wait um but it, you know a lot of times quarantines will give updates to let you know you know the the dog's eating and going to the bathroom great and so those are the kind of pieces we try to make sure that customers know the process so that they're mm -hmm less stressed uh during it so the the crate you, do you get to keep the crate afterwards or is it is it just a like a flying crate or is it like just like a precision pet crate yeah it's it's a crate that most people don't want in their house i was gonna say yeah. um yeah. it's not a lot of people use like the in the states people use those wire collapsible yeah. crates that they use to crate train um the ones that are allowed for pet travel uh, here in the States, we use kind of the rigid plastic uh, crates. Uh, if you're coming from the UK, UK loves to build the crates uh, specific for the pets. So most of the UK crates are wood um, mm -hmm. coming out. And so um, it is, uh, I'm an environmental guy. And so I hate it because I feel like it is a large waste of plastic or wood because mm -hmm. you get these crates and it's kind of like, what do I do with it now? Yeah. So we do try to reuse as much as we can. Uh, people don't want them. Uh, we sanitize them, clean them back out and uh, kind of, you know, but we, you know, we have a lot of people that go to New Zealand and then they get another change in their employment or something and they are going to travel. And so we do have pets that, um, you know, we had a pet go back and forth to China. Um, gosh, I think 27 times. Um, oh, back and forth and well that was his owner's job twice a year just went back and forth and so uh, we always tell people if there is that chance keep the crate because uh, you don't want to spend money that you don't have to but yeah. it also still has to be in good working condition so sometimes people throw them outside mm -hmm. and if that door is getting rusty or whatever they won't be approved mm -hmm. and so they do have to be in good quality all right I think it's absolutely wonderful that you are you're taking the time and the effort to come to New Zealand and walk through the quarantine facilities and look at all how these animals are being. I think that's wonderful, Brett. I'd really do. It's just 
it's a testament to your company because you don't, you know, just being on the ground there and, and having it all firsthand, you know, I, I, I think that it's such a reassuring thing. I think that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So. It's really important to me. And, you know, I've always said for, for our company and then for the industry, I want to raise that bar in pet travel. Mm-hmm. You know, pets aren't commodities. Um, they're family members. And so, you know, I, I was working with an airline, uh, one of the largest airlines in the world. And I said, for your passenger side, the bar isn't, well, we just didn't die uh, when we fly. Like, that's not that's the true. bar we set. Yeah. But for pets, a lot of times it's like, well, at least they're alive. And that's not how pets should travel. Uh, they're family members. They should travel yeah. as best as possible. Uh, we we know a lot about ways to mitigate stress in pets. We know airlines that really care about pets. And there are some great airlines. And sure, there's some bad stories out there. But, you know, all in all, for the percent of pets, like, it is a really safe way to transport your pet. And I, I know because we hear it every day of the week, like, I can't leave a family member behind. I'm not leaving one of my kids behind. I'm not leaving my spouse behind. And so, like, you know, I got to figure out how to make it happen. So what, is it, what does it take to do that? So, you know, we, we, we keep that bar. Uh, I want to ensure people, our salespeople tell people all the time, like, we're not just telling you something. We're proving it. We've been on yeah. the ground. We've seen it. It's important to us actually do that we actually even send videos we filmed videos in new zealand of quarantine of this process from auckland just to say like this is important to us that we actually do this in the country not just speak about it from the u.s side yeah exactly yeah that's yeah. that's the thing isn't it it's true is it true brett that uh pets can watch tv on the flight <laughs> <laughs> uh, they cannot watch TV on the oh, flight. Right. <laughs> uh, no, no TVs uh, down there. Um, yeah, no TVs. Um, no eating even. Uh, no food Express. during travel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, people do. It's amazing what people do try to fit into the crates. Yeah, and we tell people, especially when you get into a country like New Zealand with quarantine, like things aren't allowed because yeah. they don't know what bug or could be in that and so like we tell people like don't put the favorite toy in there don't put you know now it's common for like air tags the apple air tags to be slipped on so people can track yeah well those don't make it uh they get destroyed because air tags actually have a battery compartment yes and technically they say there could be a bug they got into that and we don't want that in our country and so we tell people all the time like you know let's let's put a nice bedding in there but after that, like, we don't want anything that has such sentimental value because it's not going to make it through quarantine. Yeah. They're not going to uh, keep those things for you. So no, that's good to know. Yeah. And, oh God. right. I, I'm going to try and keep this short because I know this was the, um, we've taken up quite a bit of time, but uh, listen, if this, this is the other thing that comes up as well. So what about people who've got an animal that is really getting on a little bit, getting a bit old, and they're thinking, oh, you know, maybe we should put off our move to New Zealand for another three or four years because I don't think, you know, my dog will make it or the cat will make it. What what would you say to people like that? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's happening more and more often. We are keeping our pets alive longer. And there's been great new science and you can do chemotherapy for your pet, um, you know. And so what we have seen is as pets have gotten older, you know, stress can have more of an issue on a pet. And so we tell people all the time, that's why you and your vet need to have a lot of conversations. You know, our role is kind of like the travel agent. We know the way to get your pet there, the documents, we're not vets. And so we can't tell you that, yes, your pet will do great or, you know, this issue they have uh, will be fine in travel. Um, you know, diabetes is, is a big one now where pets need an insulin. And what people don't realize when they come from the U.S. is, you know, New Zealand's a couple hours ahead of us uh, time-wise. And so when your pet needs a shot, you know, twice a day at this time, but, you know, they're in travel 
a decent amount of time where they can't get that shot. Airlines can't give those shots. Um, most quarantine facilities won't give um, shots. And so there are some of these things we kind of have to walk through of what would prohibit any travel. If a pet is cleared to travel, then it's really working with your vet. And that's why in the U.S. and most countries, there's called a health certificate that has to be issued by the vet. And it has to be issued within most times 10 days before their flight. So it's right before their flight. And it's a vet doing a full exam saying, we feel from our expertise that this pet is fit to fly. Mm -hmm. And so we take that and say, okay, if a vet is signed off and the customer is signed off, then, then, you know, we're moving forward with travel, but we help people because we put it in three different categories. One is elderly pets. And elderly is also dependent on size. A large dog is elderly a lot of times at seven years old, where a small cat might not be elderly at seven. So we have elderly, we have pre-existing conditions, and then we have breeds. Um, so flat-nosed dogs or snub-nosed dogs, be it like a, a French Bulldog, Boston Terrier, sometimes they have a harder time just breathing normally. And so travel can make it harder. And so those three areas we work with the customer and tell them like they need to have a different conversation with their vet that they wouldn't have if it wasn't their pet was in one of those categories. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we highly recommend that vet relationship is so important. Mm -hmm. um, they're the experts in this. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's where, you know, sadly we, we do, we see it where somebody's moving and they're like, we know our pets old, but we can't leave them behind. Mm -hmm. And, and, it's just one of those things we've seen it time and time again, where pets have done those elderly pets have just, they're troopers yeah. came out great, you know, not stressed at all. And so you just never know uh, when it comes to a dog or a cat. Um, but that conversation with a vet is really important. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's great advice. So is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you feel as if you would like to say? Um, I think, you know, what we see is places like New Zealand, while it's really harder to get to, um, if you are looking that you're going to go there, but you are moving again somewhere else, just know a lot of times where you're going is going to be much easier. <laughs> um, coming into the state mm -hmm. is so easy. Yeah. Uh, there's no quarantine. It, it's great. Uh, it's very easy. So if you are frustrated with the process to get to New Zealand, if you ever leave New Zealand, then you're going to be like, this is just a breeze. This is easy. <laughs> so um, That's brilliant. And then, and then second, just plan ahead. Uh, we have people that have already like booked travel for, you know, 2024. And, and while we can't confirm flights or anything, and, th and that's one thing people don't realize too, is most airlines, we can't book flights until like 14 days before travel. Wow. And so there's not this, like, I can go ahead and book a flight for, you know, December uh, today if I wanted to. But most pets are only getting booked within a very short period of time. And so um, that's why it's important to kind of go through the steps and then we can ensure that things do run smooth. Mm. Oh, I can see that's your good, dogs good, in the background. Good timing for the dogs. Yes, yeah. uh, I know. Uh, I have my parents, so we actually have four golden retrievers in the house right now. Oh, so. Okay. Um, so I have my parents' two dogs and our two dogs. So, and I just want to say, for the record, before I let you go, I just want to say this because it's 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 admirable. It's just it's lovely. This conversation that we're having now was never going to be a podcast because we were trying to work out whether we should bring your you're 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 the top of your company, aren't you? This is your company that you own, and we were trying to be like, okay, so shall we speak to your person on the ground in New Zealand and? You have just sat here, the head of this company, and talked to us like I'm your best mate about travel, pet travel, coming into New Zealand. And you don't know how reassuring that is for a, for a, a pet owner to just be able to talk to someone and one-on-one -on -one like that. And I can see you're an animal lover. And like I say, you come to New Zealand and your company is all about keeping that pet happy. And it's, it's just lovely, Brett. I just want to say thank you so uh, much. I really do. Yeah. Well, thank you. We love what we do. Um, and we're blessed to have a great team behind us in many countries. 
um, that get to get the beautiful videos back of the family being reunited. And so for us, that is, it's such an important piece. We don't take it lightly, um, the stress that it can be on a family. And so we, we love, we absolutely love what we do. We're all animal lovers. And so it's a great, it's a great piece for us and what we do. So. Oh. Oh, that <laughs> and on that note i'll be sure to leave yeah, on that note yes i'll be sure to leave all the links in the description but thank you so so much for taking the time and and sharing all you have to offer about pet travel to new zealand thank you so much brett thank you guys i've enjoyed okay. the time yeah Speak that's been great thanks very much I really hope you enjoyed that show as much as I enjoyed recording it. If you're moving to New Zealand and you are interested in joining the Slack group, the private community group that we raved about and talked about on today's show, then you need to head over and get our free five day video guide. This is a video guide that sends you a video every day for five days sharing some aspect of what life in New Zealand is like. It's absolutely free. And then when you get to the fifth day, you'll be given the option of whether or not you want to join the private community, the one that we talked about. It's a fabulous, fabulous resource. I don't need to say anything more because you've already heard all about it. Go over, take the free five day video guide, get to day five, and then you can decide whether or not you'd like to be a member and join our private community along with me and Brian and all those other fabulous people that are walking along the same path as you and making the move to New Zealand. So head on over to www.nzahead.com forward slash free. Head on over to www.nzahead.com forward slash free and get your free five day video guide, get to day five, and then you decide if you wanna come and join us in our private membership group. I hope to see you on the other side. We left the UK and moved to New Zealand 13 years ago. So me and Brian know exactly what it's like to live in New Zealand as Brits. But I've always wondered, what would it be like if the tables were turned? What would it be like if a Kiwi moved to England, for instance? What, how, what, what would you say the lifestyle is in New Zealand? How would you just sum it up? Again, it, it, it varies because um, I, my dad uh, ran a pub in Greymouth and I went from Christchurch to Greymouth and it was like going back about 25 years in New Zealand <laughs> terms. Oh God. I, God knows what it was like going back <laughs> yeah. from, from here. In this week's show, you're going to meet Tim. Tim is a Kiwi that left New Zealand 14 years ago to go and live in the UK. In three weeks, he's returning back to New Zealand to live. He's bringing a wife, two kids and a 20 foot container filled with furniture. Let's go and find out all about his life and why he's coming back to New Zealand.